Hola, Hola, so. Mm. Ah, sing there. Can you yeah. hear me? Can you hear me? So now I've discussed the horse sacrifice. So next I'll speak about the fire, fire pujata, Agni, called the Agni Adana. Agni Adana is The Agni Adana was the most important ritual for the Aryans in their daily lives. And the reason why it was such an important ritual And the reason why it was such an important ritual <clears throat> is that the households, all the heads of the households at that time had the uh, responsibility for preparing the mandalas and for lighting the holy fires and so forth. And if they didn't carry, take those, uh, uh, fulfill these responsibilities and light the holy fires and so forth, it'd be a sign of uh, disrespect for the gods and disbelief for the gods. Not only that, in terms of the life of a Brahman, and they had to spend four phases in their life. The first phase was the phase of celibacy, and there was the phase of household life. The third was the house, phase of forest life, and the fourth was the uh, phase of living on alms. So they had to go through all of these four phases in their lives. And now we'll speak about these four phases in the, uh, it later, but we won't speak about them today, but generally the phase of celibacy is the, is the time when they go to study and learn the Brahmanical texts. And after they have finished their education, after that phase was completed and they had to return back to their houses, what they had to do was immediately get married. And at the same time as you get married, what they had to do was they had to, they needed to light the holy fire in their household. And the ritual for lighting the fire is what is called the Adnyadana. It's got the, the uh, offering to Agni. At the time when you do, do this was either on the first day of either the waxing phase or on the face of the waning phase. So in the Tibetan cow, the first day of the Tibetan cow, the 16th day of the Tibetan month. So it'd have to ha begin on either of those two days. Now it took two days to actually complete the entire ritual. So on the very first day, you would have to appoint the four sacrificial priests and you would build two hearths, a round hearth and a square hearth. And sometimes there had to be a, another hor of, of, uh, hearth, a third hearth in the shape of a crescent that was facing south that would be placed in between the other two. And so at first one of the priests would uh, start the fire by rubbing two sticks. So I'd like to show this to you. So you had to start the fire by rubbing the sticks. You know, when you have a fire pudge, what you have to do in the fire is you have to rub the sticks. I think you can you can see in the middle of the, the older one is holding the this the stick right this is the this is they're rubbing the rubbing the sticks and starting the fire so they 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 start fires by rubbing the two sticks it's not just any fire <laughs> Uh, 
this the same way as people uh, started fires thousands or tens of thousands of years ago. They used the same uh, way to start the fire. And then once the fire has started, they have to go through five different steps to purify or to uh, the um, uh, start the, to uh, perform the rituals. They went through five steps. And at the end of the first day, there was the Brahmin, right, the one who had gone to get who was going to get married. So the one who's getting the Brahmin who's getting married. would uh, recite the names of the gods as he would then uh, go inside the, the house where he was now being married. Now at that time, the, the, the priest who had led the, who would teach them how to start, the, the, pri the priest would uh, teach them how, the two of them, how to start a fire by rubbing sticks, have to teach them the technique and the reason why he'd have to teach them the technique is that the second day, the next morning, there is the square fire, the hearth, right? And the fire in that hearth, uh, they they would have to start the fire in that by rubbing the two sticks. And so for that reason, you had to teach them how to start a fire by rubbing sticks. And then after they've been taught, the next morning, then in the square hearth, they would light the fire. And they'd kneel before it and uh, prostrate to the gods. And that fire would then be let to bar burn all night. And then the next morning, a Brahmin would come to put it out. So these rituals are what we call the Agni Adana rituals, or the the offerings to, uh, to the fire god Agni. So this is a ritual that you do once in your lifetime, I believe. In any case, this ritual is also a very important ritual. And so now I've spoken about the Sama Veda and the Yadur Veda. And so now I'd like to speak a little bit about the fourth Veda, the Atharva Veda. And the reason is because this Atharva Veda is, is related to our mantras. So I'll speak about the fourth of the Atharva Veda. So the Atharva Veda is the fourth of the Vedas. If we're talking about the four Vedas, this is the fourth and the last, the latest of the Vedas. Now the three earlier Vedas primarily teach the sacrificial rituals and hymns. They're, they are texts that primarily speaks about those. And so fundamentally, The the Yajur Veda and the Sama Veda were based upon the Rig Veda with a few other texts added to them, right? They were, it's not that they are completely unrelated to the Rig Vedas, but the Atharva Veda is a bit different. If we talk about it in terms of philosophy, or then the Atharva Veda is at a slightly higher level than the Rig Veda. Now, the Atharva Veda itself, if we think about it in terms of the chapters or parts, it has 12 books and has about 6,000 stanzas. Now, its primary topic is mantras or rituals to protect from spirits or illness or poisonous sticks or dangerous animals, bandits, and so forth. It teaches many different mantras for these purposes. It also teaches many mantras for a long life or prosperity or good health or easy travel when you're traveling abroad or also to achieve victor, uh, victory over others. So it teaches many different methods or pith instructions on how to accomplish these. Now, generally, if you're wondering when the Atharva Veda appeared, at, at this point, it's really not clear exactly when it appeared. But if we kind of uh, estimate, we'd say it's probably around the same time as the Yudra Veda that the, uh, that the Atharva Veda was, uh, was prepared. 
And in particular, there was really not much of a direct connection between the between the Atharva Veda and the other three Vedas. They're separate. So for that reason, there is a period of a fair period of time where people did not accept that the Atharva Veda was actually one of the Vedas. At the time when they accepted the Atharva Veda uh, was a text, was a Vedic text, was only after the start of the Common Era, after the um, the year zero. And so, if we think about this, this this year the Atharva Veda. Uh, it was only a few hundred years after it had been first written down. So it's only after the Atharva Veda appeared and was written down, and several centuries later, uh, centuries later, it was recognized as one of the Vedas. That did it. Now, the original name of the Atharva Veda, and so the, at the very beginning, I should say, for the original name or at the very beginning, this name was the Atharva Angiras. It was probably called the Atharva Angiras. The Atharva Angiras, so there's an, it has two words, the Atharva and Angiras. So it's made of these two words. And these names are the names of sacrificial, two sacrificial priests from ancient times. Now, there's one of the traditions that came from the a priest named Atharva. And the main function of this tradition, the rituals there, are primarily the peaceful and enriching uh, rituals and activities. So that's the primary function of these jobs, of these rituals. Now, the Angira tradition, where it's a, it's a work or its focus, this particular job is uh, the activities and mantras for sorcery and wrathful uh, and wrathful activity. Later, the practices of these two traditions were to combined and made into a single text. And so that is what is now we call the Atharva Veda. So the origin of the Atharva Veda is and different than the earlier Vedas, it's a different way, so it's kind of different than the other Vedas. So now in general, when we talk about the Atharva Veda, there's a lot about mantra there. Now the word mantra, there are many different terms that were used for mantras, but in action, but the meaning is that we can understand them as being mantras. So in the Atharva Veda, there are many different mantras, and not only that, before that, even during the Rig Veda, time of the Rig Veda, there were the term terminology of there was the terminology of the Rig Veda. So, in the, for example, in the 10th and the last, or the 10th book of the Rig Veda, there was a, there is a section of hymns called the Purusha Sukta, which if we talk about it, talk, it would be called the songs of the being or the songs of the cosmic being. Now, in this, there's the word for, uh, for mantra or chandas, and so here's the word chandas appears. So in Tibetan, we uh, it's probably okay to, if we translate it into Tibetan, we'd use the same word ngā as is used for mantras. So it's not just during the time of the Atharva Veda, there was a term for mantras. Now the word mantra was not there, but there's a word with the same meaning at the time of the Reg Veda. Uh, so we can so we can understand that there was this term at the time of the Rig Veda as well. 
Now, as I mentioned above, the primary topic of the three earlier Vedas is uh, sacrificial rituals and the, what's related to them. And the topics of the, the contents of the Atharva Veda are primarily related to mantras. And so for this reason, in ter- there's a big difference in terms of the contents. Um, because of this big difference, people did not accept the Atharva Veda as a Veda when it first appeared. And, it not, and because they did not accept that, they did not consider it as either like a root or a fundamental text of the Vedas. At that point, it was just a text that was involved with mantra activity, but it was not otherwise considered a special text. But later, uh, the Brahmas began to expect, accept that if there was a uh, Vedic text, and the reason that this happened is that the way the Brahmas began, I think the Brahmas who performed the rituals, right? So among the various Brahmas, they would think, we have, we only know how, they would think, we only need to do ritual, and that's not okay. And the reason is that we absolutely also have to be able to, we need to be able to show some particular power, being able to increase life force and merit or destroy enemies and structures and so forth. Because if we don't have something of practical benefit to show to people, then, then, the, the reason is that they currently believe us to have this power of a direct connection to the gods, but if we don't see some power, they're going to lose that faith. And so for that reason, they, in order to uh, begin to pride, develop greater interest in the thought of a Veda, in order to see how much they could increase their powers, of being connected to the gods and develop special powers through the rituals. And so that's why they developed the rituals, the interest in the Atharva Veda. And the reason is because there, uh, the Atharva Veda has many instructions and mantras for increasing powers, and that is why they began to cre- take a greater interest in it. And in particular, in order to make kings have long reign for a long pain and to also to be able to defeat the enemies. And if the Brahmins didn't know the mantras for doing so, they wouldn't be able to be the uh, be the priests, uh, basically the priests, the spiritual advisors to the king, right? They wouldn't have this position of the royal priest of uh, Purohita. They wouldn't gain that status. And if they... And how we know that they wouldn't have that, uh, that status is that later, uh, there is a, later, a text written later called the Atharva Parishishta. And so this is, this is like a supplement to, or an, an addendum to the Atharva Veda. And so what it says in that text is that And so you have the Purohita, the royal priest, who was, in order to be given the status of a royal priest of Purohita, you must be fully trained in the Atharva Veda. Once you are, if you have not fully trained and not mastered the Atharva Veda, and you do not know the activities described in it, you wouldn't then you had no, no right to become a person who would perform, be the priest who performed rituals for the king or who helped the king increase their power so basically for the the kings had great belief in the um, in the activities of pacify, pacifying increasing um, magnetizing and destroying and so the and so for that reason the priests the kings the royal priests had to ha- have uh, be fully trained in these rituals now so for these reasons what people thought at that time and said oh, you know the, all the rituals explained in the vedas and they're very co- complicated they're, they're not actually, it's not so important. What actually can practically, um, what can actually help you power immediately are the mantras, they said, and they reckon, had this sort of new way of thinking. And so for that reason, the Atharva Veda's uh, uh, status or um, uh, its position grew better. So in the end, what happened is the Atharva Veda became a Vedic text. 
And so in order for becoming to a text of the Vedas, is when you say it's a when you say it's a Veda, uh, one of the four Vedas, then it's like one of the, the fundamental texts. And once it and in order to become that, you have to have some sort of a, an influence or a power. And so that influence and power. is be able to see that something, you have to have something that you can show the power that people can see with their own eyes. Now, when we say mantra, how do we understand mantra or mantra activities? So in a mantra actions or activity, what, how do we understand this? No, it's not exactly the same as we speak about it in the um, in the um, Vajrayana texts. So what a ancient people believed is that all dangers that occurred, what did they come from? They came from spirits or malicious gods and demons. Or else it was someone else performing sorcery. And so that is why all of the threats and dangers come from, uh, came from. And so for that reason, through the power of mantra, you'd be able to accomplish your own aims, aims, or you'd be able to weaken or eliminate someone else through the power of mantra. And there's secret instructions on how to do this. The, there's a, a superior instructions. And so for that reason, And so for that reason, this uh, this became very widespread during the Vedic period. The mantras became very widespread. Now, the three previous Vedas are primarily uh, for performing rituals and sacrifices, but the Atharva Veda is to accomplish in someone's uh, desired aims. Their mantra activity is to do this, right? So their, their particular functions or particular objects are different. And be, the reason is that sacrifices are performed for the powerful gods. Now, when you're doing a mantric activity, who that's for is for the the, the gods, the, the evil gods, or for the ghosts, the spirits. And so how do we know this? It's because they invoke the gods or the demons to accomplish their aim. And they make them into into your servant, to someone to going to help you in order to accomplish your own aims or to harm other people. So when you talk about sacrifice, the sacrifices and rituals, it's primarily body and speech that's most important. But in mantra, it's your internal power, the power of your mind that is most important. Now here, when we when I talk about, for the, in order for there to be mantras, you need some, uh, in order to have the mantras, what you need are, the, you need certain conditions. You need two conditions. And the first condition is that you have to have a mantra that has power. If you just recite a few words, say it's a mantra, it's not going to work. You can't say anything you want. People say, people make up various mantras these days, right? We Tibetans, we make many name mantras and so forth. And we take a you know, little bit of mantra and we said, Om Bibba 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 Soha. And in the middle, you put any sort of nonsense in between and make it look, look like a mantra. And people think that that's okay, but that's not right. A mantra has to have power. Something that when you recite it has to have a power and a benefit. And just saying it's a mantra and reciting nonsense from math is not okay. So it has to be something that has power. And the second thing you need is a, a thing that symbolizes it. Now, if we used a Buddhist term, we need basically a mudra. So a mudra here doesn't necessarily mean a mudra that you do with your hands. You need a madra or mudra or a sign or a symbol of it. You need a thing. 
And if you have these two, and then you have the, the things you need in order to perform a mantric activity ritual. So for the mantric activities, there are many different types. So now I'm speaking about the mantras here. The mantras I'm speaking about those in the Atharva Veda, and there are several different categories of them. They're basically there. There are primarily three categories, the peaceful, the wrathful, and the enriching mantras. So those are the three characters. Of course, there are many different categories, but these are the three main types. So, so there are also, if you add the mantras for sorcery to them, then you have the four different types of, of mantras, the, adding the sorcery. So if we're speaking about passful activity, piece of, piece of pacifying activity, what we're speaking about uh, is in order to to prevent harm by uh, prevent harm from other sorcerers, to, to pacify the sorcery and to pacify spirits and obstructors. And when you're doing the peaceful activity, you do it in a respect in a gentle way, in a respectful way in order to avert their harm. You give them a bit of an offering, uh, give them a thing, and you give them a device with a bene benevolent mind uh, in, order to, in order to please the, the spirits or obstructors. Uh, that is how you uh, uh, avert them. For example, when we have a, uh, for example, when we, when we, for example, we have the, peaceful and the enriching the wrathful and stuff They're like the peaceful is so please take this go when we're, so when we're when we're uh, averting um, spirits we did the same thing or you say you just said oh there's no point to you harming us here please take this in the go that's a passful a piece of pacifying way of asking of averting likewise at that time at the, they believe that if you had a headache you believe that there they believe that there is a spirit who caused the headache Likewise, if you have hail, you know, those are the there's the wealth god as the as the uh, there was the opposite of that. There's the hail god who's going to destroy wealth. And you think if there's some sort of and if there harms from them happened, they would uh, you would say that happened because of the wealth, the 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 uh, because of the hail god. And so you'd say, oh, you'd pray to them, please, oh, please don't do uh, harm, please don't make and help them um, and pray to them in the hopes that they would decrease their power. Likewise, there's also a passive or peaceful uh, purification and so forth. And so, you would, and so what you do is so like sometimes the obstructors would be, would be made to go to, uh, to another place. You'd like take a, a uh, you take the person who is affected by the spirit and you'd rub them with a, cl with a cloth and, you'd, and then you take this cloth that had, that had been rubbed all over the body and you take it off to like the intersection in a road and throw it there. And then the spirits would go, would follow that, uh, follow that and you'd say, please go, please go, and please go away. And so that was another uh, method that they did. And for us, that'd be kind of, you know, this is sort of like a, a wrathful sort of purification. And if you did that and they still didn't do that, then you would call, if they still don't listen to then you'd call an even more powerful God and ask for them for protection. And it's like you have Agni, who's called the demon slayer, right? Or if Indra, who is said to repulse Jesus, so you'd pray to them. Uh, and 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 give the work to them, or else you take a thing that is invulnerable to the demons. There's a special thing that would that would that the that the spirits would be afraid of, is, and you and you'd hold that in your hand as a symbol, and then you'd give that to in order to to. Uh, disperse the uh, the demons. For example, you'd also make a border with uh, some sort of like water or fire or stones. Make a make a make a border around. Set the set the limits. Say not don't come in here. 
And so there's another sort of activity. So there are many different such activities, and we don't need to speak about them in detail. So that was the peaceful activity. And follow that, we have the, the wrathful activity. So wrathful activity means... So that what you mean by this wrathful activity is to to eliminate someone else. That's the aim of this activity. Is to you would invoke evil demons. We'd put our hopes on them uh, to go harm another uh, another person. So that is wrathful activity. Then there is the enriching activity. So enriching activity has the enriching yourself or increasing your like and merit and so forth to bring health to your household or to accomplish your desired aims. Uh, so these are acti uh, mantra activities for that point, uh, for that purpose. And so these, so you've got the uh, peaceful enriching and wrathful activities that are described in the Atharva Veda. are also very similar to the peaceful, enriching, and wrathful mantras described in our secret mantra. Now, here in the Atharva Veda, there's no discussion of the magnetizing activity, but within the mantra, we speak about activity. So if you add the magnetizing activity, then you have the four activities that we always speak about, the peaceful, enriching, magnetizing, and destroying. And also the Atharva Veda has uh, many mantras for divination. So I'm not going to say much about it because of time today, but you know, there are a lot of strange things that we need to speak about. But basically it means doing divinations. Usually we do divinations with the malas or with stones and so forth. It's not just that. So divination actually is like these days. Sometimes people are uh, uh, sometimes people are inhabited by spirits, or they're possessed by spirits, and that's what in the past would be called divination. So the traditions we have now uh, of that so in India they take like young children who are like four or eight or nine, and take a child to, and through through a mantra condition to then have a make a god um, possess them and enter them and then ask for uh, prophecies and so forth. And so we don't need to speak about those today. Likewise, when you talk about divinations, today the Tibetans have a lot of superstitions too, right? If you see, a, if you see like, um, if you see a crow on the road, you have a, a you get you get afraid, right, and so forth. And so, in the same way, you'd have many other things uh, similar in the India. So they have ways of explaining signs that you saw in dreams and so forth. But I don't need to see to say too much about all of that. So, in brief, in the Atharva Veda, there are many instructions on divinations and mantra activities and medicinal preparations and so forth. And so with all these uh, different types of mantra activities, there are many different types of them. If we speak about these different types, to just show, so that you can just show you, under, I thought I would explain them to you. And the way that we describe them, there are many different ways I can describe, but the first of these is that in the from the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century, there was an American uh, uh, philosopher or a scholar who was also well-versed in uh, Sanskrit. And I don't know how to pronounce his name and probably be disrespected, so I'm not going to read his name. But in... But he describes the different types of, of mantras as being in different types, in nine different categories. And I'll just read these. If I think I don't need to read them, you can just look at them and I think you can basically know. So among these, there are, there are the peaceful, wrathful, enriching, and destroy, uh, peaceful, enriching, magnetizing, destroying activities. And so there's many that are uh, related there, so I don't need to recite each of them. 
uh, because we can't, they're not all in English. Their mantras can cure diseases, long life, or for pacifying spirits, mass appearance for pretending to women and mantras for kings and to create harmony, to increase prosperity, to eliminate misdeeds and to purify, to accomplish a aims and so forth. And so there was also a, so now there's another scholar, a Japanese scholar, who is actually a very great acharya, a great master, a Buddhist master. Uh, and he primarily studied the mantra uh, and described it. And he described the, uh, the, he described the different mantras in the Tarava Veda in different sections, also in, also in nine different sections. And these, I don't need to read them. I'll read them in English. They're healing medicines, long, lengthening life, enriching activities, purifying or toning activity, calm or generally activity and activities for women of violent activ activities for kings and Brahmanic activities. So, but what's important to know about here is that there are the names that we talk about. This, uh, this uh, that is similar to the terms that turn up in the uh, the the charyas, and, and including the charyas, we have two different. We have the we have the different has with the susiditras and the later uh, samadhi, uh, later jhana and the on the full environment of Varachana and the vajrashekara tantra. So these are four tantras in the charya tantra. If you think about in the in the susiddhi tantra and the uh, and some of these and the and the the later jhana centered these are in Chinese. So some of these. Are, so now, some people say that that it is uh, the uh, there's some of the tantras. It's, dist it's disputed which category they fall in. But here, if we talk about the Susidhi Tantra, is a text that primarily teaches the rituals and activities of the uh, Kriya Tantra. And so, I will speak about it more later. But basically, there's the Susidhi Tantra. And likewise, in terms of our Tibetan explanation, there is also the there is the um, tantra, the full enlightenment of, Vaj of, of Verochana, which we consider to be in the Charya tantra. And so, and so these have the same names for the different types of mantras as for the peaceful, uh, increasing and peaceful, enriching, magnetizing, destroying uh, uh, activities. Not only are the names similar, the contents are actually very, very similar. Now, there's also the Vajrashekara Tantra, which is included in the Yoga Tantra. And so in this Vajrashekara Tantra, in addition to the pacifying, uh, enriching, and uh, pacifying, enriching, and destroying activities, there are two more. There are the, um, also the activities for, uh, for summoning and magnetizing are added for five activities. Likewise, in the Vedas as well, of these five names of these activities also appear with exactly the same name. It seems the the second the, the the names of the activities in Sanskrit also appear. So for this reason, and all the activities of pacifying, enriching, magnetizing, organ and destroying all our and all their the rituals and the mantras. The source for all of them have as their source and their seed. If we need to look for that, then it probably goes back to the Vedic texts. Uh, so that is where you'd have to, if you're looking for it, you'd have to go look for them in the Vedic texts. Likewise, you have the fire pujas taught uh, taught in the uh, in the in the in the Buddhist puja pujas. These are also found. They also have their origin in these um, rituals. So in brief, for these reasons, when we think about the rites and rituals of the uh, and the practices of the secret mantra, and have their seeds uh, or their seeds can be found in the Vedic literature. When you talk about the Vedic literature, it's something that has like an over four thousand year history, right? And so it has an over four thousand years of history. And so it's from 4,000 years ago. So how is it that they changed when they went from being Vedic texts and became Buddhist texts? How did, did they develop? Well, it's difficult to say this com uh, completely differently. For the first thing is that we don't have any actual 
we don't have any historical sources because in as i said the other day we don't have any clear historical documents says the origin is not clear so now we thousands of years later we're not knowing anything saying it's this or it's not that it's actually difficult for us to say that but one thing we can say for certain is that the practices, the methods of practice taught in the Vedic literature and the methods of practice taught in the secret mantra are very similar. And that, and if you ask, is that similarity? Is that just a mere coincidence? It's not. There definitely was a connection between the two. Or else there are stages of development that are intervening between the two of them. So that's how it must be. Now, some people might think, if that's so, then the secret much of Vajrayana, then all of our rituals are were previously Hindu rituals, and we don't have anything that's different, do we? But there's no reason to, to worry about this, I don't think. I think we can take a broader view. We need to have a, I think so we should take have a, Think about things in a vaster way. And the reason for this is that in our, because we how much look how much we have in the in the we have quite a few different things like like the wealth practices in Tibetan Buddhism. They're like the young droop practices and the and these were not these are not Indian texts. These are actually things that were in Tibetan from, from ancient times. Where they came from from Tibetan texts, they they had been in Tibetan from ancient times and later after Buddhism flourished, started to flourish in, te- in Tibet, the practices were then made to fit with the Buddha, uh, with Buddhism, and their contents were altered slightly to make them fit with the Buddhist view, and they gradually became to have uh, the these wealth practices that are that uh, fit well with Buddhism. Similarly, in India. Where were the Buddhists before? They were in Indian society, right? As I said, on the, this is the reason I had to say this on the first one. The, the reason why we have to talk about where Buddhism came from. Why did the Buddhist monastics have to wear particular robes? And we have to... And many of the other aspects of of the Buddha of Buddhist customs and views are greatly connected to Indian civilization, and this naturally happens, right? It's not like the Buddha at that time. If you didn't think about the people at that of that particular time, and were only to say things that they just couldn't get their minds around, that wouldn't benefit them, right? One of the special features. Uh, Particular feature of the Buddha is that is that he would very skilled in teaching Dharma in a way that fit with that time and place. So he would teach in a way that fits the way people with the way people think in that time, the way they felt faith, what they considered uh, valuable. And he take this as a basis for his teachings. If he had said Dharma that they just could not understand at all. And a few intelligent people would say, oh, I don't quite understand, but you said it so before. You said it, so I'm going to believe it. But other than that, there'd be another way, right? It, w- it would be difficult for, it would have been difficult for it to have any uh, practical benefit. So it's important for us to understand this. So now I'm going to continue. Now what I'd like to speak about next, as the time progressed, and what happened is that They're being a develop what we could say skeptical views, or if we say let's say in English we'd say philosophy. We came to the time we basically eventually came to the time when philosophy developed. When we talk about philosophy, before you have philosophy, you have to have doubt. If you don't have doubts or question, then you aren't going to develop any philosophy, right? So how do we develop doubts and skepticism? I'm wondering how did this world form? Before, people hadn't thought about how the word formed, but gradually as people's uh, thinking developed, they began to wonder, how did this word, world come into being? How, where did we come from? 
and they began to think about things on a more profound level. They began to be skeptical. And in the future, what's going to happen? What was the beginning of the world? In the end, how is it going to be destroyed? And they would uh, consider and investigate many, many remote um, events and think about them. And they began to think about these questions. And then the previously in the Rig Veda, it was, it was holding the sun and the moon to be the gods and then thinking of, thinking and uh, thinking about the nature as gods. So instead of having such a simple way of thinking, uh, thinking about so they began to wonder how did this world and its beings come uh, come into existence how did they uh, and they begin to investigate such inaccessible issues how were the heavens and earth formed and uh, because they began to think like this what happened is that they developed philosophy in uh, they began to develop their own philosophy in India. So how is it that the philosophy spread? Is it in the later uh, Vedic period of this? Is that earlier people had kind of a nature worship and, view, and uh, thinking of the natural things as gods, and this changed. In the past, they had thought that they're, for, they moved from a time of that view of viewing there being many different thoughts to from a polytheistic view into coming to a pantheistic view. And was a saying, instead of po uh, pointing out different things and saying each of them is a separate god and saying that they're different individuals, not just that. But actually saying that actually the divine actually permeates all things. The, the God is like the nature. It's something that permeates and pervades everything. And so they began to develop this way of thinking. So first, they believe that there are many gods in India. When the Vedas appeared, there wasn't just one god, there was many gods, a whole, very many gods. And in some ways, you think about it, it's very easy to say there's a god, and that's it. This is just basically believing. It's just thinking that it's just enough to think there's a god. It's like the, the answer says, and there's a god, and there's a god, and I think it's probably like that, just believing that, and just believing that is enough, right? But when you talk about a pantheistic view, and you're saying there's a pantheistic view is actually is actually not quite the same. It is actually related to philosophy. It's actually related to logic. It has to be related to scripture and the logic. In particular, it has to be related to logic. Uh, to logic. Now, what are the specific stages that happened in this transition from polytheism to pantheism? So what are the changes that happened in this from worshipping many gods to worshipping an uh, all-pervasive god? And so that, that actually there is some discovering that you can explain a great deal. There's quite a bit to say about what the Vedic texts say about them in, per, in, in particular. There's a lot to say, but... Um, it's too much to say about it, but if we speak about it in, in a very simple or a very coarse way. So in the very beginning, when you think about the reason why we needed to speak about pantheism uh, as an, is something is important for us to understand this reason. It's because this pantheistic view is a very important for us. It's a, the reason is that it's like the beginning of the Indian philosophy. So as after they had gone from the, the idea of there being many gods to a pantheistic view, uh, that then the Indian philosophy, philosophies began to develop. And then uh, eventually our, our Buddhist philosophy developed. And so there's like a region, a, a, a sequence of the development of this. And so we absolutely, must, first, if we're going to understand uh, the, for Indian civilization is how they went from a polytheistic view of there being many different gods to being that there's not just the forms of different gods, but the nature or the uh, the essence of uh, the, the gods became the essence of all things. 
So we have to understand how this changed. During the, when the Rig Veda first appeared, and the way that you worship a god was very easy. If you say one god, if you say Varuna, it's Varuna himself, it's not anyone else. If you say Indra, it's Indra and not anyone else. If you praise Indra, you're focusing on Indra himself and feeling faith for him. It's not related to any other god. But gradually the hymns in the in the um, as they offer the, the, the hymns in the Vedas gradually changed. In the later ones, there was kind of a new way of praising the gods. And what happened is that, is that they began to uh, write hymns to all of the gods as contained within one god. For example, what it says, it says, it says, it says in Agni, at the first time that you are, that you are lit, you are a Varuna. Then when you burn, you're the form of all it is, it is so it's like seeing, uh, seeing Agni as a uh, one god to claim, uh, and containing other gods, either one or two, two or three or six or five, uh, five or six different gods all combined in one god. So this uh, way of thinking developed. And we look at these words. This. We can, uh, when we look at words such as this, they show us that the, these uh, the people of the time had the thought that many gods could be united as one or combined into one. And now, in the th uh, first part of the third book of the Rig Veda, there's a particular line at the end of every st st stanza, and this line is Mahad Devanam Asuryatyam Mekam. What it means is that. All the gods are one in having great powers. All the gods are power, and in essence, they are one. And what this shows is that gradually, people who the people who had previously identified the gods as all being separate, is that gradually they believed that all the gods were the same in essence. So this is a new view that appeared at that time. This is what this shows us. And then, after a certain amount of time, what happened? This is not only was it there are many gods who are developed in one, it began, they began to say that all philosophies are, say, uh, all, philo all phenomena are contained within one god. And what's, what this is saying is that there is a word in the uh, Vedas, and I don't need to say it, to say it uh, literally, but to give it the minute. And it's saying, saying Adita is the or heavens, Adita is the ground, Adita is the you know, father, mother, and children. Adita is light skinned and the dark skinned people, and Adita is arisen and non arisen. And there are things like this, and um, we have words like this in the mantras. He said, You are the father, you are the mother, you are the daughter, you are the, the, you are the, the and we have words like this, uh, we have uh, sayings like this in the mantra as well. So it's very similar. So when you look at these words, what it shows us is that. In the past, they had seen all the gods as being separate, but actually they begin to think about, oh, actually the gods are maybe all the same in, in essence. And so maybe at first, like maybe seeing two or three as being the same, and then gradually seeing that all the gods are the same in essence. And as a good, it's, and as the, the way I think grew vast and vast, it's not just the gods, it's all phenomena uh, are the same in essence. They've all come out of a single uh, original source. All, uh, all phenomena are the same in essence, they thought they believed. And so at that time, somebody talk about Adita. Instead of Adita is a father and mother, somebody Adita is that god Aditya is not a major god. So at this, that's not the main thing. What's the important thing is that it shows the way they're thinking and the way their philosophy was developing. So at that time, the people that what people at the time thought is that all phenomena have come out of a single essence or out of a primordial cause or condition. And that there must be like some original cause or condition of all phenomena, they thought. And because that's such a thought developed, the ancient Indian philosophies all then began to develop. Now, in terms of Buddhism, we'd say the non-Buddhist, the extremist, we'd say, we either call them extremists. They're either nihilists or eternalists. And the 
saying that their their views did not um, fall down to either uh, our ex we'd say that they fall into the eighth extreme of eternalism and nihilism and so forth. But so we use such words now, it's not a good way to think about it. Sometimes we only think about things in terms of our business. And so so here, I think it's a proper for us to use the word extremist. Instead, the Indian philosophies, the way they spread, is after thinking in such ways, and they've come to some kind of, uh, conclu this sort of conclusions. Now, when this the, the philosophies first developed, the way they they well, the way they thought or the different types of there are different basically three different types of philosophies that appeared at that time so there are three main sources of philosophy at that time and the first of these is to say that at that time what people thought at the time is that the is that the original source or root of all phenomena must be the same if must everything must have the same essence and they must come from one original source and this way of thinking is a very important uh, 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 view in Indian philosophy. It's like the basis for Indian philosophy. Not only that, some Japanese scholars say that that the Mahayana assertion that ultimately there's a single vehicle, right? We have this, that ultimately all vehicles are the same. And we say that they arise it. Now, this is a hypothesis. It's difficult to say it with any certainty. Uh, we cannot say that, but it is basically uh, a hypothesis. And so this is among the three, this is among all the different philosophies, this is the first, the most important one. Now, the second important one is that basically when you talk about phenomena, there's the way they appear and the way they are. And the way they appear and how they change, things change. You know, when we look at things, you see that many different changes occur. But the original source... or in their actual essence. Actually, none of it. And so next, when the, the, all phenomena have many different appearances and undergo many changes, but all of them, they are not outside of the original source or the original cause. They exist as a signal, a single nature. So they are not, all phenomena are not a different thing than the original source. So if you talk about the phenomena and the nature of the phenomena, these are the phenomena and the nature are not different. The, the phenomena arises from the phenomenal nature, like the like an ocean, it's waves. So it's like an, a wave arising in an ocean. So the phenomena is not separate from the nature of phenomena. So the phenomena occur within the nature of phenomena. And so this was another way of uh, thinking about it. And this also later, uh, this also had a great influence on many late um, uh, philosophies that developed later in India. So some Japanese scholars say that when we look at the uh, the Indian philosophy, uh, Indian philosophy that developed later, the, the Vedantas and the Samkhya school and and many of the positions of the mind-only school are very similar to this uh, view. This um, so the seeds of these philosophies all come from the same view at that time. The basis of this comes from that. So as developing that, and it's developing further and further, then eventually these uh, schools appeared. Now the third, uh, the. The third philosophy is that all phenomena that all phenomena arise from a single original source, but that original source is unchanging by nature, unmoving by nature. It does not change, but within its expanse, many appearances happen. Many phenomena occur within it. All the phenomena exchange, but the original source itself does not change. And so there's this way of thinking, right? And it's also a very important way of thinking. Now, also, so many of our Japanese scholars say that, is that in the Mahayana, we speak about the Dharma nature of suchness. We talk about it as being permanent and unchanging and say that this is a very continue, similar way of thinking. And so basically, at that time, 
there are many different views and many different analyses that occurred. But because of all these different ways of thinking, later, whether we talk about the Hindi, Hindu philosophies or the Buddhist philosophies, uh, these were all influenced greatly by these original views. And particularly within our Buddhism, we talk about the 12 links of interdependence. And the seeds of the 12 uh, seeds of, of interdependence also find their origins in the, in the Vedas. And the reason is we speak about the different words, like uh, the ignorance, formation, consciousness, and name and form actually appear with the same terms in the Rig Veda. Basically, when we speak about the source of the 12 lengths of, of, of interdependence, it's very difficult to find actually the original source. Many scholars have investigated, but haven't found any. But later there was a, there was a Japanese scholar who said that actually these, there's a, there's a found something that teaches the, something that teaches these words and their meanings in the, basically the same way in the Rig Veda. And so there is a, a hymn, it's like an epine, in the words of these, of this, of this hymn, And he says that the words of this hymn probably be, were the, the seeds for the later Buddhist teaching on the 12 lengths of interdependence. So for this reason, what we should say is that for, from one pers perspective, our Buddhist uh, philosophy, what we normally think of it is that the Buddhist philosophy is in its entirety. was something that our kind teacher thought of himself only, the only things that he thought about. And of course, when you talk about it from one perspective, that's how it was. Through his own practice and through his realization and through his practice, the experiences, uh, the experience, that's what he taught. He taught his experiences. But as I said before, at the time of the Buddha itself, of the Buddha, at the time of the Buddha himself, he had to, he lived in the Indian society at that time. That's the era that he was born in. And so when he was teaching the Buddhist, uh, teaching Buddhism the way that he taught, so when he taught, he had to match the way people used language, the way they thought and, the, and, their, and their ideas. And he had to take that as the basis if you were to speak in a language from another world, no one would understand it. And so for that reason, Buddhism, uh, our current Buddhism arose in India. And since it was, since it developed in India, it uses the many of the different types of terminology and ways of explaining things and philosophies developed in seeds that were in Buddhism. If the Buddhism, if had developed in Greece, in ancient Greece, then it would be related to Greek society, and it would be have great connections to the philosophies of that of the Greek society at that time. It's very clear that this would happen. Now, if Buddhism had happened not on this on this planet, but on on Mars, for example, then it would all then it would use many Martian philosophies and tar terminologies. And the reason for that is that the Buddha himself, one of his Particular features that he taught in accordance with the time and uh, time and place. He, his teachings, he taught in accordance with the way the, the 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 learned people of the time thought and talked and how they acted. And so, for that reason, some of the aspects of the philosophy are similar to the ancient Indian philosophies and practices. This is not something that it has like a harmful emphasis. This is not something that we should be cr uh, criticized in particular. And so, but, it's, but instead it's to show that we have a very, they have origin, that we have a very long development, a long history of the of Buddhist, um, Buddhist thought. So at that time in India, during the time of the, video, uh, the Vedas at that time. 
uh, there is already a very high level of thought and a very excellent level of thought. And the Buddha, Buddhism, when it developed, then had an even higher level of thought. And even what, like, even at, at the highest level of thought. And so at that, if we think about it on one perspective, it's because there's so many, high, we can recognize it as such a, uh, such a, an advanced philosophy at that time and something that we can really be confident in. So I don't need to say too much. And so that's enough for today. So now please recite the dedication prayers. Yeah. <laughs> 